we've brought together three excellent scholars um, specializing in the history of science and technology um, who all encounter um, in different ways this border between lab and field sciences as it applies to satellite technology. We've listened uh, Christine Harper, we've listened also Sebastian Grefsmull, who will, who will not be joining us today, unfortunately. And today we will be listening to Chung Ming Va. Um, before him, uh, before no, after him, Christine Harper will provide some comments and then we will open the floor for discussion. So now let me introduce our speaker of today. Uh, Chung Ling Va teaches history of science and philosophy of science at the University of Amsterdam. He has published numerous studies on the history of the environmental sciences, addressing topics such as big ecology, the concept of landscape and ecological complexity. Another research question of his is into the notion of different styles of science. He's the author of Styles of Knowing of 2011, and more recently, What is Truth? A New Philosophy of Science of the Sciences and the Humanities, 2018. So Chongling, it's an honor and a pleasure being able to listen to you today. And now you can start whenever you're ready, please. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. And, um, and I want to share with you um, uh, not only some thoughts, but also some um, uh, pictures. And in fact, I'm, um, I'm starting with a bit of, um, if you don't mind, with a, with, a, with a bit of art history. Here you see a landscape painted by um, Jacob Ruisdael in the 17th century, a famous Dutch painter who was um, equally famous during his own lifetime and, um, and at present he is uh, still regarded as one of the foremost painters of the 17th century. And um, um, so Reisdahl was a typical landscape painter, and um, this, uh, this is one of his paintings that was much later on seen as a, interpreted as a fair ecological representation of, um, well, a particular piece of landscape. And the same applies to um, uh, sorry for the uh, bit smaller uh, picture. This is a picture of um, made a um, well. It's, it's probably what the, the 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 painting was probably made executed in um, in Amsterdam or at least in the Netherlands. But the 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 details and the sketches for it had been assembled in um, Recife, uh, um, what was then Dutch Brazil. And this uh, painter, Franz Post, was sent on a, um, what in fact a colonial mission to, to document the, um, uh, the features and the riches of that particular uh, colony. And um, so almost 200 years after they completed their uh, Reisdahl and Post, uh, when they um, uh, uh, completed their, their, their work, their work was taken on again by, um, or commented on by a, um, a very famous geographer, uh, Alexander Humboldt, uh, around the year 1800. And so here he is. And um, Humboldt commented on the paintings by Reisdahl and Post and a number of other Dutch painters. And he, um, he argued that uh, these painters had captured the ecological unity of the places where they um, resided and where they painted. And um, so the, the very notion of ecology was of course total anachronistic to the to the um, uh, to the seventeenth century, and yet Humboldt um, um, argued that um, 
uh, Reisnau and Post and other Dutch painters had this proto-ecological feeling so that they gave a, a good render, ecological rendering of the place that they were uh, depicting. Um, that was a very influential position that Humboldt developed. It's not totally true. And, and just on a side pass of this presentation, I will show you another 17th century painting, uh, which totally belies what Humboldt said. Um, namely, here it is. This is a uh, landscape produced by um, Hercules Sagers. And um, just watch it for a minute. And then you see what a um, strange um, jumbled um, uh, landscape that is. What you see is a, um, on the one hand, you see a what could possibly be a Dutch river, lowland river, but uh, together with um, Italian rocks. And also in the foreground, you see Amsterdam canal houses in a uh, combination that um, um, has never been together at no place on the planet. Um, and so um, um, uh, Humboldt wisely uh, did not comment on this painting or uh, Hergula Seger's work. Um, so what we may take his, um, his um, uh, discussion of um, this um, uh, painting by Post and the painting by Reisdahl as a, uh, as a form of creative misinterpretation, but very influential. And um, here is a picture by a contemporary of, of, um, uh, of Humboldt, of Tahiti, um, uh, painted by William Hodges. And here is a painting by a follower, a younger person, a follower of Humboldt, still um, uh, painted in the 19th century, Hudson River School, Frederick Church, Heart of the Andes. And um, Frederick Church was, was one of those American painters who when, uh, when um, reading, and, uh, reading Humboldt and learning from Humboldt, they skipped their Italian uh, trip and um, went on to, uh, to visit uh, South America. And so this, um, uh, this painting is a uh, rendering of the Andes uh, much in um, uh, Humboldt's vein. So what it means to convey is that there, that this is a typical landscape in which the various masses of vegetation hang together in a uh, very typical way. And, and so, and that's what, what makes up the unity of, of this landscape. Now, um, um, sometime later, in the beginning of the 20th century, a very different take on the landscape um, uh, evolved. And um, this is what you see is here. And this is what we all know when we are in a traveling in an airplane and we look down and uh, you see the typical uh, mosaic patchy landscape of um, well, of course, you see it firsthand uh, without the use of a, a lens or a photograph. Um, but this has also been um, made pictures of very extensively. And these um, have been used in the um, 20s and 30s and uh, 50s and 60s and 70s to, um, to build a, um, a tip build a, a typical geography on this um, aerial uh, photography. Now, um, yeah, here is, um, here is a picture made in the, in the, in the 1930s of, uh, on an Indonesian island. And it was commented on by um, the German um, a geographer who um, uh, boasted that he had founded the um, discipline of um, landscape uh, geography. And so this is a typical aerial uh, picture, not too high, as you can see. Um, the crowns of the individual trees um, can be, um, uh, you can identify them. And um, this was not a picture that um, 
um, this uh, German um, geographer had made himself. Um, by the way, this German geographer, his name was Karl Troll. And um, he hadn't even visited uh, the island, but uh, he had found, in fact, this um, uh, picture in a scientific publication uh, written in Dutch. And uh, apparently his Dutch was good enough to, uh, to, uh, to make sense of um, what had been depicted here. And uh, also, um, I looked up the original publication and I found out that um, that um, the the publication, uh, this 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 journal had uh, not only uh, produced this um, photograph in the in the in the text, but it also had a um, an overlay um, uh, bound between the, um, the the regular pages of uh, of the journal issue. And so that the overlay could could be put on the picture on the page in the journal. And so here is what you see when you put that overlay on it. And here you see the interpretation of the photograph. And, um, and so the various, um, um, yeah, uh, patches of the the fragments or 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 pieces of the mosaic are here identified and given a name and and um yeah and troll was enthusiastically adopted this um the, this interpretation of the um of the photograph and um he um he thought it entirely um obvious that the uh, the picture um was a good enough basis for identifying the various uh parts of which the landscape was made up and um so this would then be the new um landscape geography uh originating in the 30s and in a sense still existing um and so here is the comment that Carl Troll wrote on the on this picture and it's this and its um, uh, its interpretation. Um, although Carl Troll had not been uh, there, um, he, he hadn't inspected the um, uh, on the ground um, uh, what 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 the background, the, the vegetation, vegetational and soil background of what's being uh, discerned on the picture. And so. Um, 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 uh, Troll then writes, um, in surprising clarity, can we discern the vegetational units on the aerial pictures of Banka, a small Indonesian island, the mixed rain forest, forests of the firm dry land, with three crowns of unequal size and unequal color, distinguish themselves sharply from the uniform tidal forests. And here again is a picture that uh, this is probably a uh, picture somewhere in uh, in uh, made in uh, I believe it's no 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 it's 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 England but uh, again it's a picture that was commented on by uh, Troll and um, and here he made a, a very interesting argument uh, this gives gives a typical uh, patchy landscape and uh, when you look at it it's uh, it's comprised of um, fields. Agricultural fields and a couple of um, hedges and and so on and of course there are roads. Um, and now and now what Troll argues is that the um, um, the cultural landscape, namely the, the 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 various fields there, which all have a presumably uh, somewhat different agricultural uh, function, that they are grafted on the natural landscape. And um, and so he uh, troll was um, uh, making a plea against um, uh, large scale agriculture because then the, these differences would be erased and and he argued that um, in that way the full potential of the natural landscape could not be used by um, agriculture and so he he discerns here um, the. You know, soil characteristics and vegetational characteristics that 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 belong to uh, to the landscape, to this patchy landscape, 
And um, so um, what Troll is doing is that, um, is that he identifies here the various units of landscape. So each of these fields, um, like in the, in the previous pictures where of, uh, of like Banka 2, um, there, there, so you have the tidal forest and you have this other forest and you have marshes and each of those are, are discernible on the picture and each of those are objectively identified units of landscape. And so all the units of landscape put together, they build the larger landscape. And so what uh, Troll is in fact doing is that he is claiming a, uh, although he wouldn't use the words yet for that, a, a, um, an objectivity for the existence of these um, uh, units of landscape uh, as discerned by an aerial uh, picture, an aerial photograph. Um, let me see what, yeah, here is another, uh, it's an oblique view. Uh, and again, you see different fields and, 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 and a bit of, um, of um, uh, a bit of wood here and there. And, 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 and so again, you see a patchy, um, a patchy landscape comprised of several um, um, smallest units of landscape. And um, a, a, a troll would invent a, uh, a word for those um, uh, smallest, the, the smallest units of landscape, he, he, ca he called it the ecotope. So the ecological place in, in, a, in a, a translated literally from the, from the pseudo Greek, if I may say so. Um, and, and this word, this concept of ecotope is still in regular, regular use by uh, landscape geographers, even though they would now use um, satellite imagery to identify those ecotopes. And uh, what I'm in fact arguing is that the ecotopes were, had, have been identified on the basis of aerial uh, photography. And they have been, when uh, later in the, in the late 70s, I believe, or, or in, the, in the 80s and 90s, when, when um, satellite imagery gradually replaced aerial photography as the, as the most important um, means for uh, landscape geographers, um, the, the, um, the, the, yeah, the way of picturing of the landscape by landscape, um, um, uh, sorry, by uh, satellite imagery were in fact um, uh, retroactively fine-tuned with the uh, units of landscape as they had been identified on the basis of aerial photography. And you know, um, here is in fact the small, the small, the smallest unit of landscape um, pictured on a scale of one to uh, ten thousand or one to um, twenty-five thousand typical scale of aerial, aerial surveys. Um, now this, um, what I want to do in the rest of, uh, of my talk is um, you know, make a comparison with a, different school, with a different school in ecology. And um, um, this, this, other, this other school, there is called plant sociology or phytosociology, and sometimes it's called vegetational science. There are various names, um, but it is a distinct school of ecology. It is um, um, this school is very much underrepresented in historical research, and the reason is that um, this uh, particular school of ecology that had um, um, numerous followers. Um, uh, let's say from the 1920s until the present, um, uh, if, but even though these, this school had, has, has had numerous uh, followers, students and, and practitioners in so many countries, it hardly had practitioners, adherents of, to the school 
in uh, either uh, the US nor in, uh, in uh, neither the US nor in uh, Great Britain. And you know, when you're um, as a scientific field, when you're not established in um, English, in a large English speaking country, uh, forget it for, <laughs> for much of your reputation because uh, um, yeah, well, uh, there, th this school is very much underrepresented in 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 in, uh, in uh, historiography. Um, although it's it, it's been big, you know, uh, as of the 1920s in in Germany in Switzerland, its original um, uh, the the place where it started, in it was it has been huge in France in 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 um, in in the Netherlands. I'm sure in Denmark as well. In um, in uh, and and currently is uh, um, um, has um, it's is you know one of an, an important uh, specialty of ecology in um, in in, in uh, Czechia and uh, in other um, um, uh, Central European countries and in um, and still practiced in Algeria and, and uh, well. Um, but, you know, not so much in uh, the US and England. Now, what you see here is a, um, a picture of a typical picture of uh, uh, made in 1950. Um, and um, on the front row, you see um, second from right, that is Carl Troll, this landscape geographer who coined the word ecotope. And um, Second from left is Brown Blanquet, and right next to him is Tuxen, and those two were the most important practi practitioners of this form of ecology that I'm uh, discussing now. So what, what, what this picture conveys is that um, these people, this landscape geographer, uh, these landscape geographers and this um, uh, plant sociologist, they were sufficiently close to each other to, uh, you know, to attend the same uh, sessions at at um, at uh, at conferences, and yet they uh, were widely apart on a number of issues. So, um, what is it that um, uh, phytosociologists or plant sociologists what what they do? Um, um, they. Um, the basis of what they're doing is they um, go to a piece of land and they um, um, establish on that piece of land one square meter and they count all the plants with, on that square meter. On the background of this, is that um, the plant sociologists have a theory, and that is that plants come together in associations. The German word is Tischgenossen, which is table companions. And so um, the idea is that um, presumably that if plants start inhabiting a particular place on the planet, then uh, some uh, plants arrive there first, and once particular plants have arrived there first, they um, they are capable of um, either welcoming or bearing other plants, and so it will be different on yet other locations. And at any rate, um, on each um, uh, spot on the planet, there is a uh, there are not just a um, um, a random collection of plants, but the plants there hang together in an association. They, 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 they are meaningfully associated. And, um, and this, um, uh, these plants are called true to each other, the so-called principle of fidelity. Now, how is it that um, um, then they, uh, I must now, um, um, start again with how it is that um, yeah well here is a uh, uh, is a relevé 
Uh, so um, that a notebook with a list of the plants as, as has been found on one square meter. And, um, and on, the, on, the, on the right, it has been um, put in print. Um, now, um, how is it that a, um, an, a plant sociologist is, how, how does he identify this one square meter where he um, or she uh, establishes this list of plants of the river bay. And of course, he or she will do that this again and again on other places. And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, these plant sociologists, they spend days on end uh, in, uh, in, in some areas and they, and they um, uh, collect like dozens and dozens of these river bays, um, each of them on um, basically one square meter, there, 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 uh, there, um, uh, there are differences there. Uh, so how is it that they, how is it that they identify where they have to put their one square meter so as to um, um, write up the, the river bay? Now here is an um, um, a quotation that I took from a uh, um, much quoted um, article uh, um, by two important Dutch practitioners uh, of plant uh, sociology, um, and and this particular quotation has been widely. Um, um, you know, um, uh, referred to in uh, in numerous other publications by uh, plant sociologists. So I take it that 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 this um, describes very well how they proceed. Um, it reads: the first condition of putting a square meter somewhere is that no obvious structural boundaries are visible within the stand, and the stand is that one square meter, right? The second criterion is uniform floristic composition. It is usual to look for joint patterns of dominant and or abundant species, and then to delimit a stand where one or more species drop out and others come in. In many cases, an experienced field worker is able to judge this rapidly. Now, um, uh, I take it that this is not, um, uh, immediately obvious to everybody what's uh, being put here. Um, what's going on here is that um, this, uh, a plant sociologist then enters a, a piece of terrain and uh, he or she looks for, as it is put here, uniform floristic composition. And at some other place, there will be also uniform floristic composition, but different from that first place. Now, how to judge the first stand where there is uniform floristic composition and the second stand of uniform floristic composition? You and I would not be able to do that. Why? Because or at last, uh, um, uh, unless, of course, I, 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 uh, I, um, I do you not, not justice and you have extended floristic knowledge. Um, um, but uh, most of us, when uh, we are visiting a, ter visiting a terrain, we will be able to uh, identify a couple of plants, uh, perhaps 10 or so, um, but these, um, uh, these plant sociologists, they know literally everything on plants. And, and so what they see is that some particular plants come in at one spot and they uh, and, and not even are very important um, in terms of quantity, 
but they vanish at another spot and their place is taken by other um, flowers, little flowers. Um, and again, you know, um, and, and you know, my point is that um, uh, most of us uh, would not be able to discern the difference, the difference between one place and another place. But for a plant sociologist, it would be obvious that this place is homogeneous in its own way, and this other place is homogeneous in a different sense. And so, um, what they do then? Then, then they have them. They make two different relevés of what, for them, is known as being, um, 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 yeah, two different homogeneous uh, stands. And here is a um, a picture um, um, that um, explains that visually. So um, this is from a, a German textbook, widely used, in, uh, I, and I believe it's still being used. Um, and what you see here is a um, is a uh, a map, and the map is basic. This is, of course, a very much an abstracted map, but the map consists of these two lines and this oval and this little oval there. And so um, the, um, the plant sociologist who has drawn up this as, a, as an example, this plant sociologist apparently knows that these lines and this oval are delineating separate homogeneous areas. He knows that. Perhaps in one case we would be, we would we could follow that. Perhaps in the oval case because that's a, a, I'm just I'm, I'm 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 just making an assumption. But uh, suppose that that the oval is 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 a bit of a bush there, uh, so that we could see. But uh, the other uh, distinctions we would not be able to discern those. And um, and. And so for this plant sociologist, this the knowledge that he has of the of the of the homogene the different homogeneities of these different places on the map will identify for her uh, where to put the, the 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 stands, where where to put the square where 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 you put your square meters and then make up the list of plants. So um the plant sociologist knows something and she doesn't know another thing. What she knows is the homogeneity of one of, of one of these areas. And what she doesn't know beforehand is which particular association of plants is on that piece of land. And therefore, in order to identify which association you have there, you make the list of the relevé and you and you analyze the list on the relevé and um, um, and then you establish uh, which uh, association uh, you have before you. And so the latter step is is sort of. Um, established objectively on the basis of the floristic um, analysis of this particular stand. And here is a, um, um, an example of, you know, of, of, uh, of how um, um, relevés are being brought together. So uh, the, the, the rows here are, um, uh, the names of plants and the columns are the particular relevés. Uh, each of the column is one um, is one uh, relevé, and um, and so this is not giving you much information. You have to work on this um, um, uh, data assembly in order to be able to identify what the associations are. And what the um, uh, plant sociologist in the 
uh, 30s until the um, until the 1970s or so 1980s what they did was that they literally cut the um, you know uh, pa paper uh, scissors uh, literally uh, they uh, they cut the the the, the rows and they um, manipulated the rows the rows so that in the end you would get these groupings of the relevés and uh, and uh, um, lists of plants. And here you have distinctly delineated groups of plants that apparently belong together. And so they identify as one particular association. So here's one, two, three, four associations. Now, um, what then do we? Um, 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 here I um, I have a um, um, uh, I'm 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 making an interpretation of what uh, of of what what it, what is different about the uh, the um, uh, landscape geographers on the one hand with their with their aerial photographs and the plant sociologists on the other hand. What they both share is a view from above. Although the plant sociologist, the, 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 the view from above of the plant sociologist is obviously not very high. Uh, the distance is a mere uh, nose to toe distance, literally. Um, although there, 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 um, um, there are some cases where uh, plant sociologists did allow um, um, uh, aerial photography, um, and especially so for very for very experienced plant sociologists who obviously had an enormous uh, expert knowledge about um, about uh, areas. Um, so the big difference here is that the the landscape geographers. They grasp the smallest units of landscape objectively, because they they are delineated on an on an aerial photograph on the picture in a sense that is obvious for the landscape geographer. What it exactly is is you know that's to be identified later, but it is known that the unit is. Um, um, is grasped objectively. In the case of the plant sociologists, the units are, graphed, are grasped on the basis of expert judgment, because as I said, you have to be a, uh, um, a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable florist in order to know that you know on one particular place some rare plants are either present or or um, are beginning to disappear on another place and other rare plants come in. Uh, again, you and I would 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 not even know which plants are so important here. Um, so this um, the, the what is homogeneity? is established on the basis of actual judgment. And then, and, then, and then the nature of the units, the nature of the units is in part can be read from the pictures um, through photo interpretation. And here, the, um, especially aerial photography had, um, had um, um, developed um, techniques, very interesting techniques, and they're still being taught to geographers. Um, what they have, you know, when a um, when an um, an airplane is making pictures of a land, the airplane is obviously flying, and so it makes a picture at one particular point, and um, on, and what at one particular moment in time. And another picture at another moment in time, and um, 
And these two pictures, they overlap. And what the, uh, what the, the landscape geographers then do is that they mount those two different pictures in a stereoscopic viewer. And um, when you do that, you see so much more on the picture than on um, than we do on a just on on just one uh, picture, you know, because you see depth, you see what uh, what uh, the difference between um, uh, a tree and a, a, a tall tree and a little bush, and so on and so on. Um, and of course, there is ground truth. Um, but in some cases, apparently, uh, landscape geographers do not need that. They 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 know what's uh, what's there. And again, in the in the in the in the in the case of the plant sociologist, there is a um, they um, they establish the nature of the units in a very different way. I called it a laboratory. So it's basically this. Um, this um, this way of um, I'm I'm going back a few slides here um, yeah going from from tables like this and um, and um, working on them so that you have a table like this which identifies the association um, well you can you can you can see that as as a as a as a sort of intuitive arithmetic and. Uh, in the past, this was done manually, literally by cutting and pasting. At present, this of course there are of course computer programs available, and 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 you you do that much um, faster and, and and well more reliable in the sense of more um, yeah standardized. Um, but still, you need a you need a um, um, a typical, yeah, uh, piece of 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 data analysis here in in in, yeah. Well, it used to be done literally in the in the lab, uh, when the when the when the ecologist uh, brought back their their notebooks with the with the relays uh, to the lab. Now, um, yeah, and here is another um, another uh, picture to show um, uh, the. Um, the very different relationship that uh, plant sociologists have with pictures in general than the land geographers. This, this, um, these pages, they are taken from an important uh, plant sociologist textbook. And as you can see, there are some pictures there. But the pictures, they are merely illustration. They are not even discussed in the text. It's just to give the reader a feeling for a sort of vague feeling for um, you know where he she is geographically speaking. And so that's all. That's all what these pictures do. Now here is a um, uh, an article from um, uh, from a student of Troll. And by the way, this particular person, Isaac Sonnefeld, he was a student of the um, Plan Sociology School as well. So what he did was to try to reconcile the two. But he is having a very different relationship with uh, the pictures um, in, in the article. The, um, the pictures on the left side here, they are analyzed meticulously. And there are markers on the picture, so you know to to um, to establish uh, unambiguously uh, what's being discussed. And you see that here also. I mean, this is a um, uh, well. This was not aerial photography. Uh, Zonnefeld made these pictures by climbing into a uh, um, uh, power um, a power mast and electricity uh, tower. And uh, he did that every year for an, a, a several decades in a row. And um, you know, on the you see the lines that he is drawing on the on the picture, and he is so he is analyzing the pictures, you know, on the basis of these, uh, you know, helped by these uh, identifications that he is 
making on the pictures. And so here, very small. Here, here you have a, you know, on the on the on the on the bottom of 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 um, of this book public on the on, on these pages of this book publication, um, you see um, a time series of the very same spot made from the very same uh, position in high uh, high in the tower, um, and you see a mud flat in. Um, uh, uh, an estuary in the Netherlands, and you see how that how that mud flat is evolving over time. And again, you know, the um, uh, Zonnefeld is 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 um, is discussing um, the history of the, the the vegetational history of that uh, and soil history of that mud flat. Um, again, by ref by specific reference. To the the dates these um, pictures have been made. Um, now uh, and here again, here is here is um, uh, Zonnefeld uh, arguing against uh, the 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 plant sociologist. The units on the pictures are delineated without knowledge of the details as far as floristic and microstructural aspects are concerned. So there is no possibility for a bias because the items to be treated statistically are unknown at the moment of sele selecting the sample areas. This is in contrast to the case where selection is done in the field as the plant sociologists do. So um, according to Zonnefeld, a student of, of the German uh, uh, and a landscape geographer, uh, Carl Troll, aerial, photographer, aerial photographs provide an objective basis for stratified sampling. Um, whereas the selection of plots by the plant sociologist had been subjective. They used that word subjective to describe their own word and subjective meaning uh, expert judgment. And yet there are similarities. For Troll and for Zonnefeld, the holistic unit is the landscape cell or the ecotope. Uh, they need theories to account for linkages between the cells. For the physiologist, the holistic unit is the association. The larger landscape is built up from these units inductively. So even though the geographers have the ecotope and the plant sociologists have the associations, they do similar things with them. Um, both schools are inductively building up the larger landscape on the basis of these uh, building building blocks. All right. So um, there you have it. I'm at uh, at uh, at the end of my talk. Um, perhaps not quickly enough. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> um, Gemma, please. Yes. Um, Thank you, Chungling. That was fascinating. Um, so, Christine, do you want to start? I will. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, so thank you, Chen Lin, for a very interesting um, paper. This is not an area I'm at all familiar with, so it was it was cool to learn about. Uh, what struck me was that um, much like meteorologists who peered from both below and above, we have landscape geographers here who are appearing from um, above, farther above, uh, with aerial photography as opposed to satellite. And the phytosociologists looking at similar patches to the ground, not exactly from ground level, but from eye level, and so that they've, they've still got um, a view down on top of the plants. Um, and in both cases, whether the eyes, whether the eyes are in the sky, as in aerial, or whether the eyes are on the ground, they come to this same patchy landscape. Um, so they're, somehow their views aren't any different, whether you're high above or just a little bit um, above the situation. But what strikes me as interesting is the aerial photographs are claimed to grasp the patch objectively, um, but the people who are also looking from above, even if they're closer to it, have no problem with claiming that theirs are objectively subject, subjectively based because of their 
expert judgment. Um, so they're not, so it looks like that, like the, it's important for the geographers to have this, have objectivity um, tacked in there. And yet the supposed objective images are not able to explain themselves, as you point out, they had to be interpreted for others. And that interpretation was also dependent upon expertise that had been obtained before. So, so they've got these pictures and they're looking down on them. And they're saying, oh, well, this is what's happening here. And this is what's happening there, even if they'd not been there, but they'd been someplace else, even if they hadn't been in that, in that place. So they still have that expertise. So background knowledge was still needed to interpret the photographs, just like the satellite images of clouds had to be interpreted by people who were familiar with the clouds from looking up at them from the ground. So originally they may have been at the ground level, but they needed that same expertise to, to interpret what was coming down. And while the phytosociologists were working at the ground level, their view was not really down with the plants. It was just above them. They had to get much closer to examine, identify, and quantify the plant life within their chosen plots. Their plot choices were dependent upon specialist knowledge. And while scholars like Brown Blanquette expressed some enthusiasm for the aerial techniques, they were not widely embraced as traditional subjective phytosociological methods remained in place, even if the results of their surveys were being processed by computers. So today, um, you've got a situation where, where I'm sure big science has arrived with the plant associations. And so you've got this computer identification and it looks more objective than it was. Um, and I'll get to that in, in a minute. And then we have the landscape geographers who are also now using satellite images. And they discovered that the pattern results were the same as those pr produced by the aerial shots. So it looks to me that while objectivity is being claimed here on the part of the geographers, what feeds the objectivity is extensive specialized knowledge, just as other data that is recorded by remote sensors must also undergo some interpretation by either a human with expertise or by computer programs that have been created by those with expertise. And hence the claims of absolutely no bias seems to me a little bit more wishful thinking than is actually the case. So as I was listening to this story, I was struck by two questions. How much of the original attachment to aerial photographs and the attempt to claim objectivity was connected to geography's general quantitative turn after World War II, realizing that they started the aerial work earlier than that, when the entire discipline, both physical and human, um, was trying to gain a foothold of respectability in the sciences. And secondly, that computers don't find patterns all by themselves. They have to be taught to do that. And so with the programs being used by the landscape geographers and the phytosociologists not have reflected the expertise they had gained over the decades that had been programmed into the pattern recognition software. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very um, um, uh, perceptive and smart um, comment on the, uh, especially on the practice of the landscape geographers. And I believe you're very right. Um, there is much um, expert knowledge that um, has been going in there at, at um, uh, various levels of analysis. Um, uh, more than they they say uh, uh, about themselves. Um, so um, basically, I, I I I agree very much on uh, I agree I, I agree with you very much on on your um, on your characterization of of uh, the, the landscape geographers. And um, what I've seen uh, what I've what I've seen is that. Um, you know, there is a, um, I've, I've, I've been at a, a, co a couple of times, not very often, but I've been a couple of times at, at um, 
at uh, conferences of landscape geographers. And there is this, um, there is this tendency um, where they, um, you know, even though they show uh, pictures in their presentation, that at the same time, they make it appear as if these pictures are uh, mere pretty pictures. That's what they say. I, I learned that expression uh, at, by being at conferences, you know, mere pretty pictures. And, and so um, uh, it is as if they, it, it's, it's only the objective data that are embedded in, this, in those pictures, that that's what's important to them. Um, but, uh, you know, in various cases, I've, I've, I've been able to reconstruct that in the course of, a, um, of, a, uh, of an analysis by geographers, they do go back to the pictures to see what's happening. That, that um, uh, you can't call it uh, ground truthing, but let's, let's call it picture truthing. <laughs> um, <laughs> of their quantitative analysis that they are doing on the basis of, you know, the, all these tables of data that they have and on which they um, uh, perform their, their, uh, uh, their computer computations. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I believe I'm merely underscoring what you said <laughs> is, is um, um, uh, the landscape geographer, you know, with respect to uh, mere data analysis, the landscape geographers cannot do without their um, visual um, uh, grasping of what 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 they have, and um, and then and then with respect to the visual grasping itself, they couldn't do that without prior knowledge of what's on the ground, what's in the soil, um, and what what. You know the, what those plans are that 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 can be seen on uh, on the picture. Thanks, both to both of you. We have a couple of questions. I read the first one from Sophie Duvaux. Uh, she says, "What about methodologies which combine different scales of analysis, field survey, and satellite images? For instance, for ground truthing or ground control." She, she goes further and she says uh, she so remote sensing as complementary. It allows, for example, to scale up. So uh, what are the thoughts? Uh, and scaling up, there has been. Um, um, and th th this has been an obvious advantage of, of, of geographers over um, uh, plant sociologists. Um, Plant sociology is, in a sense, more local than um, than uh, landscape geography. Landscape geography found its 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 first applications. You know, it's it's telling that the first application, the first um, practice of 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 this aerial photography of large um, pieces of land was uh, developed in the in the former colonies you know because it, it sort of asked for um, uh, much more large scale visual analysis than um, than the the, 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 the the intricate um, uh, small scale landscapes of 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 uh, Western Europe and so it was much later, it was much later that um, that uh, um, aerial photography and uh, was applied to uh, to Western Europe. So the, 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 this difference of scale was obvious, obviously on the on the um, you know uh, it was obviously an advantage of the of the landscape geographers that they had, and 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 that also helped. To make them um, uh, this their claim for objectivity, because um, all the pictures had been uh, made in exactly similar ways, from a sort of exact similar height, uh, same lens aperture, um, same uh, photographical means of registration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so on, on on the basis of technology, they could claim a sort of um, yeah um, 
Dasson and Gallison have called that a, a mechanical objectivity. Um, because, you know, it's similarly applied on such a um, large scale. Have I, is this, is this making sense, this answer? Yes, she says. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, now, Thomas, do you like to, to, to share your question by yourself? Thank you, Gemma. Um, uh, uh, Chung Lin and I, we were both doctoral students in the early 1980s, <laughs> a very long time ago. And I visited him several times in Amsterdam. And, and, we, and then, unfortunately, we lost contact after I had published my, my dissertation on the history of ecology in Sweden. Um, and, and that's from the kind of point of departure for my comment, um, because um, plant sociologists played an enormous role and the the photograph of, of, of the people uh, you show with the conference, the Fiji Sociological uh, uh, Conference or um, a plant geographical conference that you show had two prominent Swedish um, vegetational sociologists in the, in the foreground. Um, now, my point was, I wanted to, from the, that's my kind of point of departure, so, so that, that you know that I know what I'm speaking about. Um, I have, I, I wanted to take issue with one point in your presentation, and that has to do with this so-called subjectivity of the plant sociologist. Um, Duria, which is, was pictured in the, in, on the front row in that Congress picture, Einar Duria, a kind of very nasty Nazi person actually, and I, I could get into the kind of cultural differences here between the plant sociologists who were cultural conservative, anti-modernist, um, et cetera, whereas the ecologists were much more progressive. Um, but that aside, Duria said when he was criticized for being subjective in his choice of the associations, said very emphatically, and all his students said the same, that no, 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 they were extremely objective because what they did was they turned their back to the landscape and threw a one square meter um, uh, kind of frame over their shoulder. Yeah. Do it kind of in a kind of statistically, you know, this kind yeah. of which, uh, trying to be statistically uh, taking a sample by throwing this frame uh, yeah. over the shoulder just to see where, 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 it, where it happened to land. And yes. there, the, the true object that was their true objective method of so they would very much take issue <laughs> with your point that they were subjective. They they were objective in another way, they would say. So yeah. I wonder, have you considered this as a kind of a kind of after all, a kind of objectivity? Because they would never accept being called subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know this, uh, but I believe that, that, that um, um, uh, the Dutch plant sociologist Nieder Tuxen uh, practiced the throwing over the shoulder. I believe ah, that's did. what, okay. yeah, they, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the French and the Germans and the Dutch didn't do that. I ah, believe I that the throwing over the shoulder was specifically Nordic. I see. Okay, so the yeah. Swedes threw it over the shoulder and were objective, and yes. the the Swiss the Swiss were very 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 important here, the yeah. Swiss and the French and and the but I'm not sure the Germans they thought they were kind of make kind of middle term here, but I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah, yeah. But the picture that I showed, but the, this this picture of of the uh, that I took from the uh, textbook by Dierke, uh, he was a student of 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 Tuxen. Okay. And, and so, yeah, so he, um, he explained the subjective method, you know, uh, on, this, ah. on this picture um, of how to select uh, the, the, the stands for to make the relevés. Yes. Okay. And I'm, but, I'm, I'm aware but, of, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But I don't think it kind of, it, it doesn't really, it's not a critical issue for your main thesis. But uh, I, I don't just... think so. I, 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 well, what what Dishka argues is that um, the 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 um, let's say the, the throwing methodology um, in the end come in the end the same associations arise, but it will take 
three or four more steps of computation in order to get there. Wow. That's so basically, basically it turns out to be a practical question. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Gemma. Um, are there more questions in, in uh, within the audience? I've got, I've got one also related to this objective question uh, because it is, and also in relation to this scaling up um, and about this claim for objectivity. And when, when in the 60s, I am talking about the French uh, remote sensing satellite spot, uh, which, was, which was beginning to be developed in the late 60s and early 70s. So one of the claims that the promoters of the satellite did was that precisely it was an objective tool compared to an aircraft photo analysis, which, right. was, uh, which was considered as subjective and um, too much dependent on this uh, expert judgment. So it is interesting to see okay. how over yeah. and over, as so the same argument in the history of technology is used again and again and again to promote these new technologies against these competing old yeah. fashioned, uh, outmoded uh, ways of, uh, of doing the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. But even though, you know, I mean, the, the, the programs, um, that are run on the basis of the data uh, that 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 analyze the the data uh, assembled uh, with satellite technology, they are being taught as 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 Christine has pointed out, they are being taught to see ecotopes, and and so it's it's sort of built in and and um, and so on this point, um, they are similar, they are similar. Um, but you know, I mean, the 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 the, the plant sociologists and the, the fighter sociologists, they also have an an issue uh, with objectivity because you know they they claim objectivity on one particular um, in one particular step of their analysis, and this is that you know this arithmetic, this is how they uh, combine. Uh, the various relevés on the various stands in order to identify typical associations, discrete associations of discrete groups of plants. And they claim objectivity for that because, you know, it comes out of the arithmetic. There are there is no American ecologist of any of of you know with a bit of standing that buys this argument of the phytosociologists. They just don't believe it. They don't have any trust in um, in that arithmetic and uh, and uh, um, you know, on the basis of the relevés on, on these plots. They just deny the existence of the associations <laughs> that, that come out, um, you know, in this objective fashion. So, um, um, and now uh, the, 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 the phytosociologists, they are making a comeback on the scene uh, because they apparently they have um, successfully uh, found some funding to um, to um, to build these huge databases. So the Dutch have now every relevé, every single relevé that has ever been made in the Netherlands from the 1920s until the present. They have it now in one huge database. And so they now claim a sort of um, Objectivity of numbers, you know, <laughs> of, of 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 the mere fact that they have this uh, this huge collection of 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 relevés. How this will play out, I don't know. And um, there are various very interesting comings uh, again and uh, uh, on the objective subjective question here. Um, Christine, do you want to speak the, the, them out? 
yeah, so as I'm listening to this conversation, which is really fascinating. So my thought was, so the so the landscape geographers are claiming, you know, their objective, they're they're working from these aerial shots, but they had to choose the flight path. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. they had to choose the flight path. So that that wasn't some kind of random thing. I mean, yeah. you have you only have so much money, you can only pay for so much fuel and a pilot and a plane and you're going to make your decision and you're going to send it yeah. up there you know yeah. the satellite picture at least i mean if whether it's a polar orbiter or whether or whether it's geostationary you're getting the yeah. whole big picture it's not like somebody's making a choice to send it someplace yeah. but certainly on that aerial side they had to make a choice it was an area of interest yes. um just to begin with and and then you'd have to justify well why are we picking this instead of picking some other thing so i mean then to turn around and say to our phytosociologists oh well you know flowers were pretty over in that plot and that's the one we picked well how's that any different than hey this looks like a cool patch of ground i think we needed to get an airplane to fly over the top of it that's just just struck me as I was listening to this is, you know, they had to make a choice about the plane to begin with. Yeah, that's right. No, I, I agree very much with you. But of course, now the, the, um, the phytosociologists are turning the tables, and especially in Western Europe. Um, I believe that, um, I mean, you could safely argue that in uh, the Netherlands, there is not a single piece of land that hasn't been analyzed by phytosociologists. So every single square meter <laughs> has, been, has been analyzed floristically um, by the phytosociologists. Uh, it's just a small country and there are very many ecologists over here. <laughs> um, obviously you can't do that. Uh, you can't apply this in, uh, you know, like, um, uh, the U.S. or something, or even or even um, uh, Jutland in Denmark. It's too big. Uh, not enough ecologists to map all of um, uh, Jutland um, one square meter by another. But in the Netherlands, it's been done. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, Sophie, do you want to, to um, add something in voice? I am actually uh, in my field right now. I am in the, in Svalbard, uh, in the in the Arctic, and I know that it's uh, about um, phytosociology and plants. But I think uh, having a look uh, um, to glaciology. Um, can be interesting because m now more and more um, the drones, the unmanned aerial vehicles are in use in the Arctic um, because for some reasons it can be relevant to, um, to have images. Um, um, for instance, if I think about the moraine of a glacier, um, it can be very interesting to have a flexible uh, technology to document it um, during um, some uh, rain events, which would not be possible with satellites uh, because satellite is a big thing. Of course, now the images are um, more and more accessible in terms of uh, money and um, I mean, it's it's easier now to get access. Uh, but the thing is that um, uh, in Svalbard, for instance, um, it's often cloudy, and the clouds are a problem when you have a satellite image. And then you can't really choose when you get the photos. Um, but with uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, then you can have it. And um, someone in the field can um, manipulate it. So there are actually remote sensing uh, technologies which combine a, a human presence in the fields 
and mm -hmm. uh, remote sensing technologies. Um, and uh, if I now, uh, actually, I've been able to see so many um, automatized um, ground photography. Um, and it is used a lot for plants and the pollinization as well. So, and it's used uh, in to, how to say, to um, survey the front of glaciers as well. So basically you just put a um, automatized camera and, it, and you will have a time-lapse and you are able to see the mm -hmm. changes or to see the insects uh, coming. Uh, so, so remote sensing is, uh, used in many different ways. Um, but my point was that um, maybe these two schools we spoke about, so the landscape geographers and the phytosociologists, um, maybe in practice, there are people who are in between. Um, and actually uh, in France, there were um, uh, geographers who are now retired, who worked together with Norwegian um from the uit university of Tromsø, and um it's interesting because uh, on the french parts there were geographers landscape geographers if i must say and the other parts uh, you had the botanists and um i conducted interviews with uh the second ones and they spoke a lot about associations of course association of plants and so on um so it seems that it's actually possible to in concrete term, in a collaborative projects, to gather these two schools. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my yeah. input. Uh, because what I saw is not um, not so much um, separation or opposition between those two schools, but much more like a combination of practices and uh, methodologies. So, yeah. No, that, that, that's a very useful comment. And, um, you know, in my own research, I sort, uh, I sort of um, um, had this one example of this uh, Dutch geographer, uh, Zonneveld, who had been trying to do exactly what you are saying. And so, um, so what he tried, he, um, he tried to combine the uh, phytosociological school and the um, uh, um, uh, landscape geography school and he had been a student in both schools and so he set out to combine um, the two approaches but um, he found out uh, after a while that he um, uh, that he found himself on um, uh, one area of the uh, in 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 in, in uh, that he still found himself on one side of the distinction rather than um, uh, succeeding in um, this uh, triangulation or building bridges and so on. So in that sense, uh, Zonnefeld uh, sort of acknowledged that uh, his attempt to unite the schools was failed. Um, um, yeah, this. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I should. I, 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 I should add your project. The project you're referring to in a in a uh, in a in a in a next version of uh, of the article. I'm 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 I'm, I'm really willing to uh, to um, yeah to to go into that. Thank you. Thank you for your for your comment. So. Um... Your point is that uh, satellite, the smallest unit in satellites, when when working with satellites, uh, is in total or continuity with the the one that has that was defined uh, by aircraft uh, photo interpretation. So okay for the geographic part, but what about time? I mean, one of the uh, if, if we add the time the variable time in the equation. What is the result? I mean, um, satellites provide this repetitivity, the possibility of looking the same region over and over and over uh, for a long time periods in continuity. So does it change in 
that it essentially changes the smallest unit of landscape? Or uh, what, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, um, this this landscape geographer Zonnefeld, he has he he um, he was you know on the basis of merely climbing uh, an electricity tower, he was also he's also been able to um, to uh, to um, to establish a time series of one particular piece of land, and and, and um, uh, so he did that too. And um, um, uh, phytosociologists, they have, uh, you know, in this small country, the Netherlands, they have um, uh, revisited the same place uh, over and over again, and. Um, what they did, you know, plant, the, the, the plant sociologists, they have, uh, they're very important in, um, um, uh, more important than in academia, they are important in um, uh, nature conservation uh, organizations and, 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 and so on. So um, what they are involved in is to show how uh, um, on the basis of their relevés, they show how um, 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 the, the the Dutch landscape is 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 is, is impoverishing, you know, um, through the um, deposition of uh, of um, of chemicals from uh, from industry, but particularly from uh, agriculture. And, and, and so they establish a time series here in a different sense, in a different way. Uh, but, you know, but, but even in this um, um, uh, um, low extremely low tech um, uh, phytosociology, you can still build time series on, on, um, on particular places. And so that's been done in a sense. But it's very much uh, as, as it's more low tech, and and um, you don't have control uh, over. Um, you obviously have um, uh, much less technical control. Is uh, a plant sociologist uh, making a relevé uh, right now? Is he she uh, doing that in an exactly similar way of? Like people did that a um, hundred years ago. That's more difficult to establish, even though they try. So, if there are no more questions, and it's already almost half past five, shall we close here? So, thank you, all of you. Thank you, especially Chung Ling, Christine, and Sebastian, who is not there for uh, being accepted to participate in these conversations and all the audience to having joined us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Yes. yes thank you, yes. Gemma. And especially Christine. Thank you very for your very thoughtful comment. Yeah, I liked it. I liked Thanks. it. Yes. Yeah. So, very hope, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, hope Bye -bye. seeing you soon in personally and take care. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>